All right. Well, open your Bibles again to the book of Daniel. And we'll pick up where we were at last week. I'll give them a moment to, to get things transferred over on the back screens there for you. And, uh, and remember, as we're going through this book of Daniel, that the theme of this has been hope for hard times. And um, recognizing, I mean, Daniel was a perfect example of that. Uh, being taken to captivity as a young teenage boy and living his entire lifehood then from that point forward in a captivity and um, trying to learn how to find hope, trying to see where God's purpose and plan and all of that is. And again, that comes back to uh, finding that in what God has said and who he is. There's where the answer to it always lies, though, by the way. Who is my God and what has he said? If you remember those two questions, by the way, when you're going through different circumstances of life, when you're trying to figure out things, trying to make decisions, trying to even determine how to counsel somebody through the situations, ask those two questions, who is my God and what has he said? And Daniel is learning that. He's learning by the experience in the, the school of hard knocks, who is this God that my parents talked to me about before I was taken to captivity? And then he's being told things as he studies the scriptures. We, we read them earlier, reading from the book of Jeremiah, as he's reading and he's seeing, what did God say? And then God continues to and give him future prophecies and those things to help instruct and guide him. You know, it, after the, the bombs of World War II ravaged uh, Warsaw, uh, much like the, the shellings that have been taking place in different cities along in Ukraine, um, after the people had kind of been in, 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 in their hidings in different places trying to, to, to stay in safety, they, they came back out after the, the shellings and those things had stopped and they began to examine how things were on the main street of Warsaw. The, the buildings had been just ravaged. Most of them had fallen over. One building that remained, that stood out amongst the rest and, and it, it was largely as well uh, had much damage to it, but the badly damaged um, skeletal structure was the, the Polish headquarters of the British and Foreign Bible Society. And on the one wall that remained wholly intact, it had this on the side clearly legible from the street, heaven and earth pass away, but my words will never pass away. And I thought, what a great, what a great uh, understanding that even as you go through different struggles and, and, and amidst of a, a bombing and shellings and those things, that God's word will never pass away. And so we dig into that today. We come back to this again, looking for that hope that God gives us from his word. As he encourages us that he is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, he's got this under control and it's no problem for him. And so we, we picked up here as we're in this final prophecy in the book of Daniel and we picked up here actually two Sundays ago with kind of the introduction to it as again the people had been permitted underneath of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to go back to the land that they could reinstitute worship, they could rebuild the temple and, and they had gone back and were doing that and, and were starting to redevelop worship before the time then that the people of the, 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 the area around them, the people in Israel at that time that were not Jewish people brought conflict to them tried to get them to stop, and then eventually sent letters back to, to Persia and got their, their, their rebuilding halted for 15 years. For 15 years, they did no more construction of the temple underneath of Zerubbabel. And uh, Daniel has seen this. He's been in captivity for 70 years. He's thinking, man, this is going to be great. They're going to go back. It's all going to go great. And two years later, it's halted. Two years later, there's none of that happening, and, and he's praying in Daniel chapter 10, God, I don't understand this. And he's fasting for three weeks. He fasts, and he's seeking God's face. And we saw then, he, 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 in Daniel chapter 10, he, he saw a vision of a, a, a man who is, we believe there is, we described it, there is a Christophany, Jesus Christ, coming to him. And then he's given a message by an angel. An, an angel that was actually withheld for those three weeks. And when Daniel began to pray, you remember that, that the angel had been sent to Daniel, but he was withheld by the prince of Persia. And it wasn't speaking about the physical prince or a king in a human sense. It was speaking about an angelic prince 
one who is not wanting Daniel to know this news. You know, it's interesting that, that, that Satan knows the impact of God's word on your life. He knows the impact of God's word on Daniel, that he has angelic forces that were assigned, don't let the word get through. If that's anything else, that ought to tell us, one, there is a major spiritual battle that we are each engaged in, and two, we need to not let other things push out the word of God in our lives. Isn't it so easy to get started your day, and you start your day and think, I need to get into God's word today, and then the day gets going, and you're like, well, I'll, I'll get to it at some point today. I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get to the office, and I'll work on some stuff, and then I'll, at lunchtime, get to it, and I'll read my Bible then, and then lunchtime hits, and you're going, going, going. Next thing you know, by the time you're, you're laying down at 11 o'clock at night, putting your head down, you're like, man, I haven't read my Bible yet today. You know what just took place? Spiritual warfare took place, and you lost. We must recognize the importance of getting God's word into our hearts and applying God's word to our lives on a daily basis. Spiritual warfare. Well, this angel says, so now I've gotten through and I was aided by Michael. He came to my aid and I've got back. I'm going to tell you this message, Daniel. I'm going to give you this prophecy, Daniel, because it's so important for you. And he gives this prophecy, which we've been looking at. And part of that prophecy was dealing with some immediate things that was going to take place as Israel was going to be underneath of some different Persian kings and then some Grecian kings and then the kingdom would be separated underneath of Al after Alexander the Great to, to four different uh, territories and then primarily the king of the north and the king of the south, the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies were the concern as Israel was right sandwiched between their two kingdoms. And so the prophecy is relating to Israel to God's people and Daniel is being told here's what's going to happen and then it goes through even different kings it comes to even uh, Antiochus the fourth one of the Seleucid kings who we know as Antiochus Epiphanes and he was a wicked man I won't go back through all of that he was one who persecuted the Jewish people uh, with, with, with just reckless abandon massacred 40,000 of them in one time and then set up and desecrated the temple and set up altars to, to, to Zeus and to Jupiter all around and would force people, you will worship our Greek gods or else you will die. And it was massive uh, persecution that they faced. And he was a antichrist, opposed to God, but he wasn't the final antichrist. And in the end of verse 35, we saw there is a, a, a telling why this is happening. This is for the purpose of refining God's people, purifying them, and making them white until the time of the end. Because it's still for the appointed time. And so it's making this reference. This is looking forward to at a final time. And then it introduces, as we saw this morning, in verses 36 to a new king. The final Antichrist. Who is going to emerge onto the scene during, or at the beginning of, the 70th week of Daniel, which we would know from Daniel chapter 9. And verse 27, the prince who is to come. The prince who's going to bring in and he's going to, he's going to make a peace treaty for seven years. He's going to do that and the people of Israel will say, yes, here's our Savior. He'll give us peace. He'll give us economic stability. We will fall in line. He's going to allow us to rebuild our temple and we can reestablish our worship. We will fall in line with him. And things go great for him for the first while. Until some conflicts start arising, he comes back in then after those, desecrates the temple and says, you need to worship me now. And then begins the final judgments of the tribulational period. I believe it's during that time period that we're seeing some of the conflicts arise that we saw in verses uh, 30, uh, 40 through 45 this morning. And it's going to eventually lead to this coalition of forces coming up against God's people to say, we want to get rid of them altogether. God is the one who is bringing judgment down upon not only to refine his people, but upon the pagan, wicked people of this world. And he is judging this world. A quarter of them are going to be killed. A third of the fresh water is going to be gone. All this stuff is going to happen. And we need to get rid of this God. We need to get rid of God's people. And it's then at the end of that period, as they gather in the valley of the Jezreel Valley, the, battle, the, the valley of Megiddo, a massive uh, massive valley as they gather there. In fact, one of the last 
trumpet judgments, uh, or I'm sorry, one of the sealed judgments is to allow the Euphrates River to dry up so the kings of the east, China, with over two million foot soldiers can come in and gather together for war. And then we read in Revelation chapter 19, then the skies are going to open up and Jesus Christ riding on a white horse is going to come down and with a word, with a sword that comes out of his mouth, he will speak it and the battle will be over. They'll be defeated. So we're seeing all that. And then it kind of goes in a little bit of a, uh, uh, um, in, in verses, or in chapter 12, it goes into kind of like a little bit of a summary, kind of looking at this whole time of trouble. And we saw some of this, and I'm going to try to click ahead to get us back to where we need to be. We saw the returning of Israel in the, in, in the end times. And we saw the revival in that time of trouble. As there will be, as it says in verse 1, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. What is this speaking of? What kind of trouble would there be that has never been uh, seen on this earth until that time? This can be nothing other than the final three and a half years of the tribulation. There has never been, nor will there ever be, any tribulation and and, uh, trouble upon this earth like there will be in that final three and a half years of the revelation of the tribulation there at that time it says your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book and again we saw this morning there's going to become a great revival that's going to take place during this time that God's people are going to be returning and there'll be a remnant those who are are have trusted in Christ and are going to turn back and trust in in, and there's going to be a um, revival that takes place now you may be asking the question well how did this remnant come to believe how do they know about Jesus Christ and to turn to him well God sends during the, per- the tribulational period he sends out different witnesses to tell them first of all he sends two specific witnesses who are empowered from on high who are able to who are resurrected witnesses who can proclaim and they were doing great miracles and signs and are doing this and proclaiming Jesus Christ until actually the Antichrist kills them and publicly it is seen likely it's televised they're left on the streets dead and the world because of the persecution they've been under the world rejoices over their death but they've been proclaiming repent and turn to Jesus Christ in addition to this God sets aside 144,000 Jewish witnesses 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes who are going to go going out spreading amongst the rest of the Jews saying hey the Messiah that we've been looking for has already come he came and we crucified him he's our savior you've got to repent and turn to Jesus and so you've got 144,000 Jews who are witnessing to these other Jewish uh, fellow believe uh, or fellow fellow Israeli people and we're seeing a great revival Isn't that like God in the midst of deep trouble? God is doing an awesome work. There there is incredible good things happening. There is a a turning, a returning to to Jesus Christ, which is awesome. And and so even in the midst of the worst of times, God is working and providing hope. And so we saw all of that this morning. Now let's go into the second point there in verses 2 and 3, where there is also, those are all the verses, Um, There is also a resurrection to everlasting reality. Let me read these two verses. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now when it says there are those who sleep in the dust of the earth, uh, I think you're probably familiar with this language. We see it even in 1 Thessalonians 4 that some shall sleep. We see it in 1 Corinthians 11 as well. It's speaking of those who are dead. They've been buried. These are those who have passed on. And they're going to awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so what Daniel sees now here is there's also going to be these two resurrections. When do these take place and what are these? Well, really to understand these, uh, we need to turn to, to Revelation 20. So turn in your Bibles to Revelation 20. And it's important to understand that oftentimes when you read prophecy and prophecy was given, the time gaps aren't always seen there. 
just like when we were in Daniel chapter 9, and you have the 69 weeks of the prophecy, those 483 years of, of prophecy is going to take place, and then it talks about a 70th week. And that seems like it follows the very next work to, or verse talking about that 70th week. We don't know about that span of time in between. And yet we, we're still living in that time. We're still living in that, this, this dispensation, this era of, of, of grace at this point. Well, there is also a time gap between these two resurrections. And so this is going to be in Revelation 20 after Jesus has come down in Revelation 19 and he has conquered the beast, conquered the false prophet, thrown them into the lake of fire, and, um, and, and, and there was a great slaughtering at the battle of Armageddon. And then we read about that Satan is going to be then bound, uh, Christ is going to bind Satan and cast him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And that's what's given to us in Revelation 20 in the first portion there. We're going to see a literal thousand years actually given to us six different times we see that phrase one thousand years but for in in the beginning of that period it talks about a first resurrection and it talks about that and says um, in verse four and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years and so there's those who during this tribulational period had been had been martyred had been killed for not taking the mark of the beast they had come to trust in Jesus Christ and they would not surrender and follow and worship the beast and therefore it cost them their lives they're going to be resurrected and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, when we understand uh, the resurrection to everlasting life here is seen, there's actually three different stages of resurrections that are given that are blessed resurrections in the New Testament the first one is with Jesus Christ Jesus Christ is resurrected and with him if you remember it talks about that the graves there in Jerusalem many of them were open and were there were those who were resurrected at that time with Jesus second resurrection and and by the way that he is the first fruits the Bible refers to in 1 Corinthians 15 he is the first fruits the first of the resurrection of those who will to come then the second one is that of the rapture of the church. I believe 1 Thessalonians 4 is very clear on that. That, that. that the dead in Christ shall rise first, that we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's going to be when Jesus Christ steps out in the clouds, and this is not the second coming. He's going to step out, the trumpet shall sound, and I believe this is when the rapture takes place, and those who are believers, those who are found their names written in the book of life at that point, Prior to, I believe, this is preceding the tribulation, kind of at that same time period, the beginning of the tribulation, they're going to be raptured out. And so there's that, that resurrection. And I believe that we're actually part of that, that company that, uh, that, that uh, comes down with Jesus Christ for that millennial reign period. But what's interesting, as that all is, is given to us there, um, as, as, so that's going to be that, that, uh, that period that we're, we're taking out of there. And I think that is also just the case um, because the fact that we see that takes place early in the book of Revelation. The church is mentioned in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Chapter 4, you have John going up to heaven in the vision, seeing the throne of God, worshiping, seeing what's happening there. And from there on, you don't see the church again mentioned throughout the whole tribulational judgments all that stuff that's taking place you don't see the church again mentioned until revelation chapter 20 actually revelation 19 as they come down with jesus christ and so i don't believe that the church is there in that tribulational period i believe that the believers are taken out and by the way if you remember the judgments or the the, that 70 week period that daniel saw in daniel chapter 9 who was that relating to to my people and my holy city 
my people Israel. That period was God saying, I'm going to work specifically in the lives of my people Israel. So those 483 years that we saw was directly related to God preparing his people to receive Jesus Christ coming to them, which he did in uh, coming down the Mount of Olives in, in, uh, as Jesus came on Palm Sunday and their rejection and killing of him. It was God offering to his people the Messiah. And you come to the final tribulational 70th week period, that seven-year period, and it's going to deal once again personally with God's people Israel. So there's that resurrection, but here is now this third resurrection, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the tribulational saints that are brought up, and they get to inhabit as well that millennial period. Now what is... um, so blessed about this because it says this is a blessing blessed and holy as he who has part in this first resurrection this coming together is because they're going to take part in and, and enjoy the the resurrection and um or enjoy the millennial reign with christ consider what that's like satan is bound he's no longer influencing this world jesus christ rules and reigns on this earth the curse is reversed. There's no more war. The Bible talks about Isaiah. They're going to take their swords and, and turn them into plowshares. There, there's no more war. There's peace. The, the, the lamb will lay down with the lion. The, the, the child will go and will be able to play in the, the snake's hole. and will play with the snakes without any danger because the curse is reversed. That's why it says blessed. This is a, a glorious thing. To, can you imagine what this earth would be like if there was no sin? If there was no satanic influence if that curse was reversed. Blessed is that. And, and then, but unfortunately, Daniel also sees another resurrection. And again, in, as Daniel sees it, he doesn't see the time gap that is relayed in between. As he talks about, some are going to resurrect to everlasting life. Some are going to resurrect to shame and everlasting contempt. What is that second of those who are going to resurrect to, to shame and everlasting contempt? Well, we see it in Revelation 20, starting in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades left the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Here there's a resurrection that all whose names were not found in the book of life, who were not believers, who had not determined to decided to follow Jesus Christ are resurrected and brought back up to stand before this great white throne and Jesus Christ as the great holy and righteous judge will judge and the books are open the first book is or the book the reference of books is their works that demonstrates their sinfulness their rebellion against God and they're judged according to that but the reason they're cast in like a fire is because their names were not written in the book of life it had never been their sins had never yes they had sins that yes they had guilt their guilt is declared and revealed to them but they had never had their guilt and their punishment paid for by jesus christ hence their names are not written in the book of life and so they're resurrected to be judged and cast for it forever into the lake of fire that's the bible tells us there in revelation 20 that's why Daniel sees this and he refers to it as being resurrected to, to shame and everlasting contempt. Some reference or some translations say it everlasting abhorrence, everlasting pain and d- damnation and destruction. And so there's these two resurrections that are that Daniel sees. What a what a, a hope there is for those who are redeemed. We're going to be a part, we're part of the blessing, looking forward to the millennial reign with Christ. But what a motivation as well 
to tell those around us about Jesus Christ. Because just as in that tribulational period, God has established and prepared those to be witnesses, He has also established and prepared witnesses in this dispensation. You know who it is? Us. Us who know. Jesus gave the command, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and evangelize. Go bring them to Jesus Christ. It's us. And knowing that what they shall face otherwise is that resurrection to the great white throne judgment and to be cast in the lake of fire, there's a motivation to be diligent about that. To be telling others, hey, listen, you could have the blessedness. You could have the the glorious expectation of being reunited with Christ and dwelling with Him in, in in a perfect millennial kingdom and then for eternity thereafter. Don't you want to have your sins forgiven and trust in Jesus Christ? And it's freely. And so there is a, there is a I guess, a, a motivation for us there as we consider that that is our, 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 uh, on us to do at this point. Now, so we've seen now in verses 2 through 3, the returning of Israel in the end times. There's going to be this revival, a returning of many to trust in Jesus Christ. I want to move thirdly here to the, the relevance of, of these promises until the end times in verses 4 through 13 and at this point the prophetic revelation is over so we're back in Daniel chapter 12 now the prophecy ended in verse 3 and then Daniel is given some commands and some questions are given out and what we find is he's now at where he had been given this this vision he was in chapter 10 he was on the on the banks of the Tigris River and we so, so now we we come back to that place and Daniel is standing before Christ and, and an angel and now he's going to see two angels here we're going to see two commands and two questions so I'm just going to walk this through and see this the first command is given in verse 4 command number 1 seal this up until the end Notice the command is given to Daniel here in verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. What is this shutting up the words and sealing the book until the time of the end? What is that referencing? Well, Gleason Archer in his commentary helps explain this. He says this, in the ancient Near East, important documents such as contracts, promissory notes and deeds of conveyance were written out in duplicate the original document was kept in a secure repository it was shut up it was closed up it was concealed safe from the tampering though copies might be made from it the original was to remain secure so that it might be consulted if at any future challenge of its terms were made And so what's given to Daniel is, hey, Daniel, take this prophecy that I've given to you, and I want you to seal this up, and I want to preserve until the time of the end. I want this to be that this is given to my people Israel, so that when they are there, they can read the book of Daniel, they can read this prophecy, and they'll see exactly what's going on and why. And notice he says there, interestingly, it says, it says, and many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. There's a lot of different speculation about what that is referring to. And some say, well, maybe that's referring to in that end time period or leading up to this end time period, we're going to see that, that, that travel abilities will advance. We can fly from this country to this country with no problem and knowledge will increase and all those things. I, I think that's possible, but I don't think that's what it's referencing in this context. I think it's that there is an element of that they will be seeking for answers. They're going to be running around looking for, why is this happening? What's going on? Why are we facing these tribulations and this judgment? What is God doing? And they're going to pull out that which was sealed up, the book of Daniel. And they're going to read about God's plan and purpose. They're going to read about the Antichrist and his domination. They're going to read about the revival that's going to take place. They're going to read about the resurrections and some that are blessed and some that are under shame and, and abhorrence. They're going to read about all these things and, they're going to, and, and their knowledge will increase. They'll find the answers to those things. 
And so Daniel is given this instruction here, this command, seal this up. And when they, when they pull this back out, it's going to be like they're reading the newspaper. But it was written by Daniel in the 5th century B.C. And, and so God gives this command, this is for my people, but for a later date. You're giving it, Daniel, because you are special to me. We read that. He actually says that about David or about Daniel here earlier. You're beloved. I'm going to give you some insight as you're praying and seeking about what's going to happen to, these, to my people. But this instruction is for them in the future. And so he's given the command there, number one, seal this up until the end. And then, and then the question is raised in, in verses 5 through 7. And the question is, how long? And um, Daniel now sees here, it says, I looked, I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on, the other, on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen. Now, who is that? Remember, if you remember back in chapter 10, the man clothed in linen described for us as Jesus Christ, as uh, a Christophany, Jesus Christ come in the flesh at that point, and, um, and, and, and comes and says, and by the way, it's possible there's two angels because at the mouth of two witnesses, every word shall be established. But it says, the one, the, the one angel says to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? In other words, when's this all going to take place and when will it be wrapped up? You know, it's interesting. This is an angel asking of Jesus Christ, when's it going to, how long is it going to take? We're, we're instructed there as well and what Jesus even said that not even the angels of heaven know the day nor the hour. They aren't given the insight into these things. And so here we have an angel that is asking the question, well, we're really curious. When are you going to do this? We want to see Israel revive. We want to see the, the kingdom come. We want to see all that stuff. That sounds great. When's it going to happen? And so this angel asks that question, how long? How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? And notice what happens then in verse 7. And then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So, so, so get what happens here. There's Jesus hovering over the waters. He's asked how long. He raises up his right hand, just as you would do as you swear an oath, right? If you're going to court, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me. God, I think it says. Um, haven't been in court for a long time to do that. Um, but in a double affirmation, he, he raises both his right hand and his left, and he swears by the greatest of, of authorities. He swears by the God of all authorities. He swears by God himself the God of the heavens and he tells them that this will be for a time times and half a time what is that we've seen that terminology before right we saw that in Daniel chapter 9 we see it in, uh, in other places time being one year times being two years and half a time being half a year uh, you math majors are, can get that one down one plus two plus a half is three and a half. Well, that fits, right? That's exactly what we've seen other places. This would be for half of the tribulation. But this whole, this whole time of great trouble until Jesus Christ then comes back is going to be in that latter half of that tribulational period. And that's what is being given out here. This outbreak of violent hatred towards God's people, Israel, will begin when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with the Jewish people. In the middle of the seven year tribulation. I believe that's when actually Michael even fights with Satan in the heavens. And defeats him and casts him out. There's going to be then a massive desire by Satan. He wants to kill God's people. And unless they were actually protected by God. They would have been all killed. But he swears that it will last for three and a half years. In other words. Find hope in this. That the Antichrist rule is limited. It's, it's on a leash under the control of God. Now notice this as well, but it has a purpose. 
And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. What was it it said in verse 35? God was allowing these judgments and these troubles for? Remember, it said to refine them, to purify them, and make them white until the time of the end. Well, now this ramps up exponentially in this final three and a half years to refine them, to purify them, to shatter them from their own self-reliance, their own Phariseeism, from all their other things that they would turn back to Jesus Christ, that they might do as Zechariah actually put it in the prophecy of Zechariah, that they'll look on him whom they've pierced and mourn for him as an only son, that they will turn and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as King and Messiah and Savior. They will be so crushed, they'll have nowhere to go but to Christ. And it will take the Antichrist three and a half years to bring this crushing, this breaking up to pass. Let me just say a word of application here, and this may be drawing a little bit of a stretch, but I think is also applicable. That God is doing, allowing this time of persecution, this time of judgment, to purify and to work for His people for their good. Does not God even tell us that whom the Lord loves, He chastens? as a father does his son. You know, sometimes it's difficult for us to, to pray for or to desire or to get out of the way and say, God, I want you to be able to do what you have to do to get a hold of so-and-so. God, I want you to even bring me to a place of whatever is necessary. Do whatever is necessary to, to show me and reveal me and, and mold me and shape me. And there's times where that's going to be painful, Right? We've seen loved ones that have gone through some, some times of great judgment upon their lives. And our, our tendency sometimes is to jump in and I want to I stop that painful time for them. And I want to try to fix these problems for them. But if God is bringing judgment upon those that we love as he's trying to draw them back to himself, is that not us getting in the way of God? Is that not us trying to soften the blow of his chastening hand? But his chastening hand is always purposeful and merciful and intentional to draw us back to repentance just in the same way as a father spanks his child the desire of the spanking the desire of the chasing is that they might repent and turn back and say oh, i'm sorry and make things right would it not be wrong for mom to step in advance and say hey put some put some newspapers or magazines in your pants and dad won't know it'll make it better he'd say well that's crazy we had a child do that once by the way (laughs) it wasn't newspapers um but we told her go to your your room and we're going to be in a little bit and you're going to get punished for what you did well she's pretty smart she was only probably and my wife will correct me on this later i'm sure um she was young, probably seven, eight, seven or so, eight years of age. And um, maybe probably younger than that, actually, probably six. She went in and put, took, put on every pair of underwear in her drawer. So there was this thick padding of underwear so she could soften the blow. But wouldn't that be crazy for us when God's trying to do that to get in the way of that? His chasing is out of love. His chastening of his people, Israel, we might hear of what takes place in tribulation. We think, man, that's horrible that God would do that. God had to shatter them, he says, so that they would be released of their own power and they'd finally look unto him whom they pierced. That's what it took. And God's revealing to Daniel, Daniel, it's going to take that much. But I love my people. I made covenants. I made promises to them. They're my chosen people and I will redeem them. And so as a father out of love, I'm going to allow this chastening. And so it's hard for us to sometimes get out of the way of those things and allow God to do that. Well, that's question number one. Question number two then follows in verses 8 through 12. And the question there is, well, how severe is this going to be? Daniel hears this and we read in verse 8, Although I heard, I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? It almost sounds like the same question, but it's not. It's not asking the question of how long. It's asking, what, what's it going to take to come to the end of this? How much is it going to take for them to come to this place of repentance? 
And interestingly enough, God doesn't answer the question there. He tells Daniel, go your way. Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. In other words, he says, Daniel, you can't change this. It's not up to you on this. So go your way. You continue to live for Christ. See all these things. Be obedient. But as I chasten, many are going to turn back. Know this, Daniel. Many are going to turn back in these times. But just like we saw, we read in the book of Revelation, where he said regarding the revelation of these truths, he said, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. There are going to be those who are righteous and holy, and they're going to turn back to Christ. But he who is filthy, he who is unrighteous, does not desire anything of, the God, of God, he's going to continue in that same way. And God tells that, the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise will understand. Many will be purified. Many are going to be made white in this time. And then he tells Daniel something interesting. This has brought about a lot of confusion and speculation. And, um, and, and, and it's interesting here because God is basically telling Daniel to some degree, Daniel, go your way. I'm not going to reveal everything to you. You just have to walk by faith. And, and I think there's a word of admonition to us as we, it relates to eschatology. And those who are theologians and study these things, we, we tend to want to desire to categorize and answer every question of eschatology. And, and, and God even tells Daniel, I'm not going to give you every detail. And it's it's got to be okay. It's got to be okay for me. It's got to be okay for you to say, you know what? I don't know all those details. But I'll step out in faith and trust God for those details. And there's got to be this, some, some grace as well extended that we may not necessarily come to the exact same conclusions on some of these eschatological details, these end time event details. And God says to Daniel, that's going to have to be okay with you, Daniel. It's okay. But this portion here that he comes across here, there's a lot of speculation, and the reality is, is we just aren't exactly sure the answers to this, but notice what he says. He says, and from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now that's interesting because we saw earlier in Revelation chapter 9 that the, the three and a half years is depicted for us as 1,260 days. All of a sudden now we have a 30-day differential. Why the 30-day differential? And then he's going to tell him even later on, he's going to say, and blessed is he who waits and comes to 1,335 days. Another 45 days. Why do we have 1,260, 1,290, and 1,335 days? What's, the, what's happening in those periods? And again, this is purely speculation because the reality is, is we don't exactly know. We're not exactly told. But I think it's very possible. Here's my, my surmising, if you will, what I think is possible. I think the tribulation ends at the 1,260-day mark. Jesus Christ returns on the day at the appointed hour. But then the Bible describes for us in Matthew 25 that after he conquers, he's going to do something specific. The Bible describes for us in Matthew 25 that he's going to gather what was known as the judgment of the nations. He's going to gather the sheep and the goats for a judgment that's going to take place there. It tells us, and we don't have time to look at it, in verses 31 to 46, that after Christ's return, we're going to see this gathering of the nations and he's going to divide the sheep, which is God's people, those who have trusted in him, from the goats, those who did not, and the sheep are going to inhabit the, the, the millennial kingdom with Jesus, and the goats are going to be cast into hellfire. And, and there's more details in there, but I believe that takes place during that 30 days. This judgment is going to take place during that time. Again, that's my speculation. But then he's told about a blessing another 45 days later. What is that? Well, it's interesting that he describes a blessing here, whereas the other one did not. Judgment normally doesn't feel like blessing, but this one has a blessing, and it's a blessed for he who waits and comes the 1,335 days. Uh, and again, uh, there, there, like, no certainty can be had on this, but I believe that this is now, after this judgment takes place, there's now the establishment and the preparation of the kingdom. 
and there's a 45-day period as, as the, the kings and thrones and all those things are being established, and those who now at 1,335 days are entering into the, the, the kingdom reign of Jesus Christ during that period. That's my speculation, and there's a variety of opinions of what that could be. But what we see is during that period, the millennial kingdom period, again, it's a reversal of all the results of the curse that we shall inhabit the kingdom on this earth that with Jesus as our king peace is restored Satan is gone truth dominates righteousness and peace and love will abound the curse will be lifted and the world will, be, will flourish and be beautiful again it's going to be amazing right isn't that the full circle of hope Daniel you're taken away from your people underneath, of, underneath of all kinds of uh, tribulation and trouble you're going to see this whole process that I'm doing to my people because I'm bringing them back around but I'm going to bring them back around he says by the end of chapter 12 here to the point I'm going to give them this wonderful amazing kingdom they're going to inhabit and enjoy the kingdom with Christ and so the, the answer to his question is there and then one last command is given to us in verse 13 the command to keep on Daniel with hope. But you, go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So he turns after all this stuff, it's the same way as he gave the command to Daniel earlier in verse 4, and he says, but you, but you, go till the end. So the command there really is, hey Daniel, stay your course keep at it don't quit here keep on going on stay faithful you've been faithful as a, a teenage boy underneath of Nebuchadnezzar when you were pulled out of your of your of your homeland and you had to take a stand for Christ there and you were you were faithful underneath of a, a Persian king Darius and you had to stand and be faithful to pray even if it cost going in to be cast in the lion's den and Daniel keep on being faithful keep on being my faithful man of God here don't quit. Let these things encourage you as you hear and read and understand the plans that I have. Stay the same course until God calls you home. Don't waver now. But then he includes with this three promises. For you will rest. In other words, you're going to die. You're going to find your heavenly rest. You're not going to see these things in your lifetime. You're going to die, but you're going to rise. You're going to be a part of that resurrection there's a promise of his bodily resurrection and you will receive an inheritance you're going to be a part of that you know, this is, this is, you're going to experience all of that and so walk in hope walk in expectation looking forward to that isn't that exactly how this should end for us finishing out the book of Daniel to say this is what's going to come around the full circle of hope is going to take place so let's keep on Let's not quit. Let's not waver. Let's not, let's not abandon the, the mission, the purpose that God has for us. Let's rather with, with a, a renewed fervor for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with a greater expectation of rewards that we're going to inherit in that eternal kingdom. Let's live for Him now. Let's, let's make sure we're a part of, of His kingdom and his, and, his, uh, and his purposes for us there. What a reversal that we've seen that whole process. What hope. And so I read a statement this week that seems to fit this text in the days in which we're living that Christians should be the calmest people on earth. When we see things taking place, whether it's in Russia or Ukraine or whether we see things happening in China or North Korea testing ballistic missiles or, or whether we see the gas prices at, at $4.29 a, a for a gallon or all these things taking place, we're saying, man, what's going on? Christians ought to be the calmest people knowing God's working a perfect plan. There is a full circle of hope. And someday, we're going to inhabit that. Whether we are raptured out and taken to glory during that tribulational period first, and, and, and then come back with Him to, to rule and reign during that millennial period, we're going to inhabit that, we're going to enjoy that, and then look forward to the eternal process that follows. It's described for us in Revelation 21 and 22. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote this story, and I'll, and I'll close with this one. There was a, a ship in a violent storm, in a stormy night, and the ship was driven against the rocks, and at any point they were afraid that it might be dashed to pieces that was navigating this, this dangerous area, and so the people were 
down below in the, in the, in the quarter decks. And they, they knew that at any moment things could turn horrible for them and they could all be drowned. The, 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 the ship could dash against the rocks and they were in fear until one of the men said, I'm going to go up and see the captain. So he left the lower galleys and went up and found the captain had, had chained himself to the, to the area where he could be at the, at the helm. So nothing would wash him overboard as he was going to be there at the helm. And he, he came up behind him and he sees the captain there. And the captain looked over and sees this man. He could see the worried face on this man's, this look of expression on his face. And the captain is just carefully and, and with great detail is navigating this course through the rocks and the precipices. And he smiles at this man, his worry. The man sees the smile and he goes back down. He tells everybody, hey, everybody, it's going to be okay. I saw the captain and he smiled. Isn't that what Daniel does for us with prophecy? Hey, it's going to be okay. We've seen our king. We've seen our God. And he smiled. It's going to work out. It's going to be okay. No matter the hardships you're going through, he smiled. He's going to carry us through. No matter how it seems evil is pervading and getting worse in our, in our culture, our God smiles. And he's got under control so we can rest in peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the encouragement of Daniel. What a blessing this has been to study this book. And God, I pray that this would drive us with a motivation to live for you, to serve you, to enjoy with, with pleasure what we have in our relationship with you. And a, and a desire then to be faithful with the, the mission of making disciples, telling others and baptizing and, and teaching others to walk with you. And God, I pray that as we see things around us, and sometimes we're tempted to get focused on the right here, the right now, and, 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 and be prone to worry, be prone to darkness and anxiety. Help us to remember who you are and what you said that you've got it all planned out and it's going to be okay in fact it's going to be glorious in the end may you encourage us in these days with that hope it's in Christ's name we pray amen great book isn't it man what a joy to study that I always hate when we finish a study through a book because I want to start back over and do it again um, and maybe in a few years we'll, we'll tackle the book of Daniel again if God tarries and he allows us to. But I, I've enjoyed that. Um, and I, I really wish we could have finished that this morning. Obviously you can tell we would have been there till 2 o'clock um, to do that. Uh, we, we had a, a closing song scheduled, but I've already run us late. And so I'm just going to um, dismiss us with that. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.